Um, thanks very much, everybody, for coming along. Uh, I think Natalia and I are between you guys and lunch, so hopefully we won't go too much over. Um, so the talk, as you've probably seen from the abstract from the title, from delayed polling uh, to real-time telematics with RabbitMQ and Erlang. Uh, this piece of work all started, I suppose, about August or September last year uh, when I received an email through GitHub from, from Natalia asking for some help to get something going with, with RabbitMQ, uh, which for some years now has been one of my favourite little pieces of software, Rabbit and Erlang, all good stuff. And the net result was that well, we came up with what was hopefully a pretty good solution. Well, Natalia came up with the solution. I just helped to get it going, I guess. And uh, when I had an email from Monica for abstracts for the Erlang factory, I thought, gee, I wonder if I could convince Natalia to do a joint talk. And I put together a very wordy abstract that you're looking at now. So <laughs> you've obviously all read the abstract, or at least part of it, um, which is why you're here, I guess. So. I'm not going to go through all that because that would waste a lot of time and it's very boring and there's, there's lots of words and that yellow is a bit painful on the eyes. But essentially, uh, Lucid Logistics, the company Natalia works for, um, provides an end-to-end -end solutions for, for, for companies uh, around GPS monitoring, management and tracking of remote assets via satellite. And traditionally, the data is being provided to uh, their customers in some sort of delayed fashion. Uh, either via user interfaces into uh, a database hosted by Lucid, uh, or at one point they tried a polling solution, which Natalia will talk about later, which ended rather badly. And in recent times, more and more customers have been coming to Lucid Logistics and saying, hey, look, we re really want to get this data in real time or as near as real time as possible. As soon as you guys get the feed off the satellite and decode that information, we want those messages. Um, they can then use that data more efficiently, they can fold it in with, with their internal in-house applications to maybe optimise uh, routing of their vehicle fleets or, or whatever. Um, so Lucid had been coming under a lot of pressure to provide some sort of near real-time solution and essentially what this talk about is, is, is about is the journey that Natalia went on to come up with a good near real-time solution uh, for those customers and um, how we implemented it. So I'll let Natalia talk about herself in a moment, and I'll try not to see again wordy, right? Everything I write is very wordy. Um, I work for HP Cloud Services. My role is a senior software architect. Uh, we're responsible for creating services for, for HP Cloud, uh, things like database as a service, message queuing as a service, those sorts of things. I've worked with Erlang since around about 2007, 2008. And possibly, you know, I, I wouldn't claim to be uh, the world's greatest Erlang programmer. A, a lot of my knowledge actually seems to be more in the, the, some of the internals. Um, as I've sort of said in the blurb there, I, I ported Erlang uh, to some obscure HP legacy operating systems, OpenVMS, and just recently HP UX as well. So whilst I like to think I have a reasonable knowledge of the internal working, some of my, my programming skills are maybe not as good as I'd like them to be, but I'm working on that. Anyway. Enough about me. I'll jump out of the way for a while and, and let Natalia do some talking. And, and she'll just go over basically, like I said, the challenge that they were facing with their customers uh, and the solution that was devised. And then I'll talk about the boring stuff and um, which are the details of the solution. And you know, we'll put up a few slides with some little bits of code and things like that. Over to you. As Brett mentioned, I work for Lucid Logistics here in California. Uh, we provide telematic solutions uh, to our customers, end-to-end -end solutions. Um, I work in web development, have been doing web development for 15 years, with last seven in telematics field. And so um, a little background on the company. Um, so end-to-end -end solutions with a um, subsidiary of uh, Quake Global, I don't know if you heard that, na uh, that name, but they provide hardware solutions. Uh, and we use the hardware platform to build uh, into full solutions. So uh, we utilize Iridium Low Earth um, Orbit Satellite Network and uh, our own proprietary message protocol. And then as a last piece, we expose a piece of uh, web software. It's a web portal for our customers to look at their data. Um, worldwide customer base, so customers are not just in North America, but anywhere in the world. Um, all kind, different kinds of industries, but typically when you think about satellite, 
It's um, remote areas, and what happens in remote areas is um, mining, oil, gas, some military operations where there is no cell, uh, cellular coverage. Um, the types of messages, oh yeah, uh, so there's a lot of players in our field, obviously. Most of them are in cellular uh, field and not a lot of satellite end-to-end uh, uh, -end providers. We do uh, both uh, satellite, just pure, pure satellite and dual mode, which means that we cover you in cellular area, but then once you cross, once you lose reception, we uh, start using satellite to transmit the data. So that's very helpful and that allows you to save money uh, when you're in cellular field. Uh, the, uh, what sets us apart is that we provide over the air firmware upgrades and configurations. We guarantee message delivery, which is pretty important because a lot of uh, commercial satellite networks, they never, once you send a message to your asset, they never give you an acknowledgement of whether that message made it all the way through. They give you an act um, at the gateway level, but then you don't know what happens. So we had to implement our own um, ACK NAC um, mechanism to make sure that our customers know exactly what's, uh, what's on their units. Um, what else? So the types of data that we provide is obviously location of our assets. We provide emergency notifications. For example, if vehicle broke down somewhere in the middle of nowhere and driver needs help, uh, we install panic button in the vehicle and um, um, driver can press it and hopefully his manager can dispatch help in timely manner. Um, what else? Vehicle driver uh, behavior, we track that and that's pretty important because um, uh, a lot of big companies, it's, it's a liability for big companies if their driver, uh, for example, speeds through a school zone and then something bad happens. So they want to make sure that drivers are not speeding, then also um, fuel economy is very important, fuel efficiency, so we track excessive idling. Um, so excessive speeding, excessive idling, excessive harsh braking, so that those are the types of things that a lot of customers are, are interested in monitoring. Um, asset health data, so when you talk about telematics, it's not necessarily location, although in most cases we're talking location data, but we also monitor fixed assets. Uh, it's called um, SCADA, I guess. Uh, uh, supervisory data acquisition and data acquisition and something. <laughs> Forget how that abbreviation uh, spells out. But uh, so if asset has JBus protocol, uh, and that is usually big generator somewhere or big truck, uh, we can read information off of sensors uh, running on that protocol. And those types of things are coolant temperatures, oil pressures, RPMs. So any kind of uh, information that it get, gets expo exposed through JBus, we can read and we can transmit. And that's important to um, customers that have like generators somewhere in, in the jungle and they need to send like a maintenance person to make sure that it's um, healthy and operating well. So this way they can remotely monitor it and make sure that everything is working as expected. So um, telematics, and we uh, stole a couple of definitions from Wiki here, but essentially telematics just means um, long distance wireless transfer of uh, computer data, and it can be any data, although in most cases people think GPS location, but it's anything. And um, so here's the little diagram that um, kind of describes the message path how it, so we have a unit installed on one of the assets. The unit, it's like a little black box. It has GPS chip, has uh, its own uh, operating system. It acquires location from GPS satellites, then it reads the data off of vehicle or uh, any other asset, then transmits the data over satellite network to um, Iridium gateway, and then we get it in our data center eventually. We parse the message and display it on, uh, uh, web, in web application and on mobile devices. Um, specifics of Iridium network. Iridium network is a low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit spans uh, from around 100 miles to about 800 miles above the Earth's surface. And this is where all human space flights take place, except for lunar landing, um, but most of them are within that range. 
Um, Iridium constellation spans at altitude of 475 miles, I believe, above the Earth's surface. It consists of 66 satellites and six spares, uh, and it covers entire Earth, so there is no dead spots, as um, in the case, like if you look at other uh, satellite providers, which are called like geostationary is one exam example, they are located on high altitudes at about 20, 20, 22,000 miles, I believe, above the Earth's surface. And their positions directly above, positioned directly above equator. And they have great coverage uh, of the equator area, but then once you get farther away, uh, the coverage degrades pretty quickly. And, and so advantage of Iridium in this case is that it covers entire Earth. Uh, another uh, thing about Iridium uh, uh, network, which sets it apart from other LEOs, is that each satellite on that network can talk to neighbor satellites. And where it's important is when satellite goes over uh, the ground station, if it doesn't have enough time to establish connection and transmit the data, then on any other network, you're out of luck, essentially. You have to, the satellite has to wait until it sees another ground station, and then it will transmit the data. So the latencies then go from seconds to minutes and even hours, and in most cases, it's um, unaccept unacceptable to a customer. So Iridium um, satellites, they talk to each other, so if one did not have enough time to transmit it, uh, delegates this task to another one, and that other one uh, finishes the transmission. And uh, usually the latencies we've been seeing are within 30 seconds for um, a single message. I've seen some messages come back in like under 10 seconds even. Um, because the service is so superior and so great, it's um, very expensive. So to be able to use it and stay competitive, we had to uh, work on some strategies. So Iridium provides a couple of services. The one that we're using specifically is um, called SBD, Short Burst Data surface, uh, Service. Uh, we send little packets of data and usually every single packet does not exceed 250 bytes. Um, our messages are much smaller. We try to stay within 10 to 20 bytes and we try to stuff as much data as we can so we're using every single byte carefully. <laughs> Uh, so we can transmit a lot of data in a very small message. Um, we, um, um, let's see, yeah, highly compacted messages, and um, yeah, some other algorithms. <laughs> I guess I, ca I can't really talk about here. But this is an uh, example of one week worth of uh, satellite traffic. Uh, this is data from 2011. Uh, we are in white, so that white um, area is the service that we're using, SBD service. They also uh, have this high-speed uh, data traffic for phone calls, for satellite phone calls, and uh, some, uh, some others, oh, I guess for internet, and voice calls are in yellow. But this is your typical traffic that um, Iridium uh, manages. Uh, again, so our messages are pretty compact. Uh, we. Um, follow our own, our own internally developed message protocol. Uh, we have pretty light load compared to some numbers I've heard here yesterday. Uh, we don't have high message throughput, but as our customer base increases and uh, as we start reporting on um, additional parameters and start monitoring some additional things, messages grow in size and um, load increases. Um, so the challenge. Uh, when people subscribe to our service, uh, a lot of them um, are happy with what we can provide and they go and they log in to our um, backend. We try to keep our pro uh, product generic because it's a it's multi-tenant environment, so we try to keep it as generic as possible, but you can't because certain customers will have different uh, requirements all the time and, and we don't want to you know like spin our wheels and deliver to each individual customer so in which case um, our backend becomes unusable to them because it doesn't satisfy all, all their rules so typical um, historically the way the data was served was through reports scheduled or ad hoc reports through web UI through email alerts um, and uh, to satisfy requirements of uh, these customers with their own business rules, uh, we would use SOAP web services. 
And the customers we're talking about, they're typically larger customers with, um, like I said, some custom business rules, or maybe they already have another telematics solution in-house and they have another backend. They don't want to deal with two backends. They just want to accept like data feed and then deal with that on their own conditions. So this just like what's going to follow. Um, SOAP-based solution. So initial approach for us was to provide uh, SOAP-based ser web services, which is, was kind of fine, but uh, there are some problems with it. And um, uh, first of all, customers have to poll, and that's, I guess, the biggest thing. So that means they poll on some predefined intervals, but they want to receive data in real time they don't want to poll every three or whatever, five minutes. So when we expose our web services, what we've been seeing is that a lot of customers were coming at our service every five seconds because they want to know, like, do I have anything latest? Is there anything for me? And so that was putting a lot of strain on um, our servers and database as well. So we had to actually replicate the databases so our web customers, web UI customers, don't uh, get hit with that, like, traffic because traffic was coming into the same location. So separated databases, then we had to implement the rules for people not to hit us every three minutes. And that, of course, made them very unhappy. So there was like a lot of wasted resources, a lot of unhappy customers and us as developers because we didn't want to implement this additional logic, additional like databases. So we wanted to, to message to arrive and being served to the customer and we didn't have have to worry about um, <coughs> what happens. So here's the diagram. Um, this diagram is just a regular SOAP response, uh, um, request response, and it actually outlines the whole path from the time message hits the satellite, um, goes through gateway, goes to our processing server, gets stored into database, and then gets, it, it, it's essentially waiting at that point for a request to come in, and then it gets served to the customer. So. So even though Aridium's, Aridium's latencies are within 30 seconds, uh, when you go through this type of scheme, uh, you're looking at minutes, and minutes are unacceptable for our customers. So those, this, this slide just outlines uh, what I, I, I just said about wasting resources and um, how servers get affected and all that. So we looked, so there, but there are pros and cons. So we so thought, like, we need to implement, implement some kind of push solution. And so we started looking at pros and cons of polling versus pushing. And polling um, is very easy to implement. That's one thing. It handles case of uh, subscriber or client going down or server going down pretty easily because if client goes down, then we just keep piling the data in database and we wait until they come and get it. If a uh, subscriber or client goes down, we don't, uh, I mean like if a uh, server goes under maintenance or something, they just keep asking for it and eventually they'll get it. So that, that case is covered. Um, but again, um, there is a, a real time element is not there. So we started looking at alternatives and we needed to find a better approach and uh, up, um, immediately when we thought about we thought about push technology and started looking at some webhook uh, based solution so what that would uh, did for us and um, was providing http uh, communication with um, flexible message format uh, it would be mostly firewall friendly and it would require no polling. So we knew that this was the approach. We just were not sure what kind of like protocol, what kind of product was available out there. So about like uh, 20 minutes of Googling brought us to Google project uh, page of PubSub Hubbub. That's a funny name for a push protocol developed by a couple of Google guys, um, Brad Fitzpatrick and Brad Slatkin. Uh, it's an open webhook based uh, protocol for distributed uh, publishing, publish, subscribe uh, communications over HTTP. And it was initially designed a long time ago, I believe before like 2008 or even earlier, uh, to support RSS feeds, to push um, RSS updates to customers as soon as there were anything new. And so subscribers under this protocol would get near real time updates. Um, and it's done uh, using webhooks um, 
callbacks, webhook callbacks. So subscriber uh, essentially uh, tells the server, here is the URL you have to post your data to, and then server start, starts posting any new data that it finds <laughs> for that specific subscriber. And um, Brett is going to talk about details of how that thing works and how it comes together with um, Revit MQ. And Okay, <laughs> cool. Like I said, I get the boring bits, so I, I get to talk about the protocol and, and other boring stuff. So Pub Sub Hubbub, it is a silly name, but the compensation for that is that you know one of the inventors of it is also named Brett, so that, that makes up for it as far as I'm concerned. Um, key components are pretty simple. Publishers, subscribers, and hubs. Uh, under the polling model, obviously, the subscriber is, is going to the publisher and saying, hey, have you got any information for me? Have you got any new data? And, and just cycling like that. Under this particular publish subscribe model, basically the, the publisher relinquishes, the publisher publishes all the data to the hub, and the hub then takes responsibility for dissemin disseminating that information to any subscribers that have subscribed to the topic in question. Um, so a fairly simple concept, and like Natalia said, basically the subscribers, um, once they know about a hub, they will subscribe to a particular topic supplying a callback URL. From that point on, whenever the publisher publishes something pertaining to that topic into the hub, the hub will forward it via that specified URL to uh, the relevant subscriber or subscribers. Um, basically, publishers are going to use HTTP POST uh, to send updates to hubs, uh, and the hubs are going to use HTTP POST to push data out to the subscribers. All a pretty simple concept. There are some other little quirks in there that I, I won't go into any detail of. For example, um, subscribers can actually you know, maybe ask the publisher, hey, have you got a hub that I can use so I don't have to poll you, um, and things like that. Just looking at it in a little bit more detail, I've already covered most of the stuff that's here. I mean, essentially, the key thing is that publishers are delegating responsibility for distri data distribution to the hubs. Um, these hubs could run, you know, uh, Google and Superfeeder have public hubs that, uh, you know, community-based hubs, I suppose you would call them, that anyone can use. Uh, or what we'll talk about soon with, with RabbitMQ and RabbitHub, you can create your own pub sub hub hub environment. Um, like I mentioned, a subscriber can, can either maybe find out via whatever means, uh, I don't know, ring up your friend and ask them what the URL for the hub is, or they can talk to the, uh, the publisher directly and say, hey, can you tell me the URL for, for a hub I can use to actually get your data feeds, please? Um, some additional details about the protocol. And obviously, uh, we're, we're talking about the hub is going to do an HTTP post, HTTPS post, uh, to push the data out to subscribers. Uh, this is a server-to-server -server protocol, so it's not going to work in the situation where, for example, you've got a PC or something like that that's sitting behind a firewall or a NAT device if, if your subscriber is, is something like that. Uh, your subscriber needs to be able to receive a feed via <coughs> HTTP post. Um, that's probably really the only restriction on it. Uh, there's kind of a simple subscription verification process. It's a fairly simple check. Um, you, you could send a subscription request on behalf of somebody else and just supply some random URL. So the protocol needs some way of actually validating uh, that, that callback URL. And it just does a very simple challenge response check to do that. And there's also another feature you can build in uh, which gives the, the subscriber some, some level of security, I suppose, around the authentic, uh, authenticity of the, uh, of the hub. Um, So from Natalia's perspective, like she said, this, this looked perfect. Uh, HTTP is, is fairly ubiquitous. Anyone can pretty much deal with that. No problem as far as her customers are concerned, uh, pushing the data out to them via HTTP post. Um, this all looked like a pretty good solution. 20 minutes Googling, we've solved the problem. That's excellent. Uh, on the um, Hub Sub Hubbub website, there are several implementations of this thing list listed. Uh, I mentioned Google and Superfeeder before. WordPress have got one that they use for handling blog updates and things like that. But, but these three, none of these three could really be used by Lucid Logistics because, uh, well, I mean, I think one or other of them you, you've got to actually pay for, but that's, that's not such a big deal. But there are other issues, like some of the data that, that is coming through this system from the satellites is, is fairly sensitive, <coughs> confidential information, and you probably don't really want it sitting out there or, or flowing through some kind of public or open hub. 
Um, so for that reason, uh, these, these options weren't necessarily viable. Uh, also, like Natalia said, also these implementations were more geared towards Atom and RSS feeds, and they were fairly specific about the format of the data that you were going to push through, uh, typically XML, and fairly large blobs of the stuff. Um, but the, the, the Pub Sub Hub uh, website also listed this thing called Rabbit Hub, and um, this led Natalia to, well, Rabbit Hub, obviously, which was an implementation, an Erlang implementation of the protocol implemented by uh, Tony Garnock Jones, who some of you may, may know. Tony was one of the original developers uh, of RabbitMQ, uh, absolutely superb software engineer, very smart guy. And Tony is also very, very prolific. If you go to his uh, GitHub site, Tony G, uh, you'll see all sorts of weird and wonderful things that Tony's created over the years and continues to create. Um, he's now up around Boston area doing his PhD. Uh, I'm not sure when that's going to finish, which <coughs> unfortunately means he doesn't necessarily have a lot of time to keep some of these things up to date, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I'd discovered Rabbit Hub, I don't know, a while back, and, and I'd taken an interest in it um, purely from the perspective around RabbitMQ of creating some sort of multi-protocol messaging hub. And as a consequence of that, I'd done a little bit of work with it. I'd taken a fork of, uh, of um, Tony's uh, Rabbit Hub uh, thing on GitHub and made a few changes. So Natalia contacted me in the hope that I could help her to get this going because it, it looked perfect for the job. What Tony had implemented wasn't necessarily a full implementation of, of the PubSub Hubbub protocol. Um, and if you look at it very simply, what it does is, as I've listed here, Okay, so if you're familiar with RabbitMQ and you're familiar with exchanges and the AMQP protocol and so forth, um, essentially it provides a very simple, almost RESTful-like interface to RabbitMQ. Um, it gives every AMQP exchange and queue hosted by the broker two URLs. One URL uh, can be used for delivering messages to the exchange or the queue. Well, strictly speaking, you really only publish to an exchange as opposed to a queue, but that's semantics. Uh, and it also gives you a URL that you can use to subscribe for messages that are forwarded on by the exchange or queue. Okay. And as per the, the pub sub hub pub protocol, um, subscriptions, subscriptions, when you subscribe to this thing, you supply your callback URL, uh, and details about those subscriptions are nicely stored in Amnesia. So a really nice, elegant little plugin for, for RabbitMQ that gives you essentially, as I say, uh, a mechanism whereby using HTTP you can publish messages into Rabbit and you can get messages out of Rabbit. <coughs> biggest advantage from Natalia's perspective here, oh, probably two, but one of the biggest was the fact that unlike some of the other implementations of the protocol, uh, Rabbit Hub didn't give a care, couldn't care less what your message content was. You know, as per Rabbit, uh, a message can just be an opaque blog, blob, a random array of bytes, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be an XML document, JSON document, it can be whatever you whatever you want to send through. And of course, you know, the reason why we're here today is we all love Erlang and all the goodness that comes with that, that RabbitMQ takes advantage of, Rabbit Hub, and um, therefore the solution is able to benefit from. Uh, you know, with Rabbit, you've got built-in security mechanisms, so as far as uh, Lucid Logistics customers are concerned, it's pretty easy to set them up with a secure login to, to the Rabbit Hub environment. Um, you've got all the administrative goodies and things you need and courtesy of Erlang and so forth, we've got some excellent fault tolerance, scalability, and performance. So, you know, almost seemed too good to be true. 20 minutes Googling, pretty much got a solution nailed. But, of course, it is never that simple. So like I said, Tony's been very busy working on his PhD, and consequently, Rabbit Hub, originally written in 2009, uh, required some changes. RabbitMQ had evolved considerably since that time. Uh, Rabbit Hub makes quite extensive use of some of the internal APIs within Rabbit uh, to make its magic happen. And, you know, it required a, I suppose, you know, a reasonable amount of effort on my part to, to bring it up to spec to work with, I can't remember, I think it might have been Rabbit 3.2.0 or 3.2.1 or something like that, but a fairly recent version. Um, there were a number of changes that had to be made to the code, as I say, to make it compatible with changes to Rabbit that had happened since 2009. Um, there were also some changes, you know, for, for newer versions of Erlang OTP, and there were some weird version issues around <coughs> MoshiWeb, which I won't go into because they cause me much frustration, and I just get upset and sad when I have to think about them. Um, 
But also as part of the solution, we had to do a number of other things. So it was fairly important for Lucid's customers that, that they were receiving data securely. So we needed to build in support for HTTPS, um, posting those messages out to the customers via HTTPS instead of HTTP. Tony, when he wrote the, the plugin originally, had, had written a really sneaky little hand-rolled HTTP client, which is probably very efficient and so forth, but you know, there was no support for HTTPS. Um, an important requirement from Natalia's perspective was making sure that messages were durable. Uh, we, we talked before about you know, what if um, the consumer goes offline for some reason. Uh, they don't want to lose messages, they don't want to lose data. So we modified RabbitHub in, in this case to, to make sure that you could publish a message into the thing in a durable fashion. So it's, it's persisted to disk and so on and so forth. It'll survive restarts of Rabbit. It doesn't matter if a consumer goes away for a while. Messages will just build up in queue. That's, that's fine. Um, we had to make a number of other changes that I, I've listed here uh, just to bring it up to spec and a few other reasons. Um, one of the funny ones that, that I did some time ago, though, when working with Rabbit plugins, is I got really, really frustrated. The guys, for some reason, have this thing they call the RabbitMQ public umbrella, which, which they promote as providing a nice framework for developing and working on plugins for Rabbit. It's a pain in the ass, quite frankly. And, you know, they really need to do something about it. So, a little while back, I, I came up with, um, uh, well, actually, I think I probably stole a, a rebar based build build process, which grossly simplifies this. So Natalia had spent something like what, three or four days fighting with this public umbrella thing, trying to get something built and working, and it just wasn't happening. And I said, oh, well, look, you know, go to my repo on GitHub and just do this, and type about three commands in, in Sigwin, and magic will happen. And um, you know, sure enough, it did. I mean, it's, it's just so much easier. I, I need to talk to the guys about that public umbrella. Um, well, that's, that's really neat and tidy. That's, that's, that's Mr. Cameraman's fault for going for the 600 by 800 resolution. Um, <laughs> that's my excuse anyway. So I'll just, I just wanted to talk about just some of the changes that we made. Um, so whilst you look at the blurry screen, I'll talk. Um, like I mentioned, one of the things we had to do was to replace Tony's sneaky little hand-rolled HTTP client with, with something that could talk HTTPS. So th the obvious solution there is OTP these days supports quite a nice HTTP client library. Um, and it was pretty straightforward to just hack out what Tony had done and, and throw in um, the, the OTP uh, HTTP client, which fully supports HTTPS. Um, so, you know, I mean, not, not rocket science in that regard. Um, similarly, uh, in addition to HTTPS, I don't think you're using it, but, but there may be a requirement for when you're publishing these messages out, when you're pushing these messages out via HTTP post to, um, to the customers and so forth, to actually push everything through a proxy server. So again, just a few lines of code in the config file and in the Rabbit Hub startup to, to load some configuration options for, for the HTTP client. Um, all pretty naughty stuff, very easy to do, uh, using Erlang, of course. Uh, message delivery mode, um, like I said, it's fairly important that, that we don't lose messages. We want to use durable queues. We want to use durable messaging. So originally, Rabbit Hub didn't, didn't do this. Uh, everything was volatile. If Rabbit fell over and died, you would lose all your data and so forth. So um, Natalia coded up, uh, and, and I helped her implement a very, very simple change here, uh, where as part of the um, query string, when you post a message via Rabbit Hub into the environment, um, you can specify whether you want persistence true or false. Again, you know, a very simple fix to change. So, so Rabbit Basic message is essentially one of the functions within Rabbit that, that you can use for publishing uh, messages into an exchange. Um, and we really just added the delivery mode to that. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with Rabbit, delivery mode two is um, durable. Uh, Another important thing to remember there when you're dealing with um, persistent messages and so forth is you must create your queues as durable queues. It's kind of pointless specifying, please persist my message, but you haven't got a durable queue. Rabbit crashes while the queue goes, while well, there's all your messages gone. Um, so down the bottom, I've just put a, a really simple command here, a curl command, um, that is illustrative of, of what you would do possibly programmatically or possibly via a, a, a script, a curl script or whatever, to publish some data into this thing. So um, we've got Moshi Web listening for incoming requests on port 15670. And in this case, we're going to publish a message to uh, the amq.direct exchange. And we're going to use a routing key of foo, which is identified by the hub.t 
topic thing, and we've said we want to persist that data. So whatever queue that's going to end up in, hopefully, uh, is declared as being a durable queue. Uh, Plug-in startup, actually another one of Tony's fantastic inventions early on in the days of, uh, of RabbitMQ, and actually I talked about this at the Erlang factory last year, were these, these magical boot steps. Rabbit spins up quite a lot of subsystems when it starts, and so Tony came up with this really cunning scheme which uses quite a complex tree structure uh, and this funny little rabbit boot step thing <coughs> to magically start up all Rabbit subsystems. And the way in which plugins predominantly used to be implemented, they would also use this particular bootstep mechanism to start up any bits and pieces that they required. Uh, with the evolution of Rabbit, um, there are now kind of different ways of doing things. And like I said, I was also having some fun with, uh, with Moshi Web. And so basically we shifted all the, 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 the bootsteps into, into um, just a, a start routine for, for Rabbit Hub. Um, I mentioned before that Rabbit Hub uses Amnesia for, for storing subscription details. So at startup, it just checks do those the relevant tables exist, if not create them, things like that. Obviously, we need to start SSL because we're going to be potentially using SSL, load our HTTP client options, spin up Moshi <coughs> Web, um, see what subscriptions are there, and basically start doing stuff. All, all pretty easy. Uh, mental note: I need to add some more error handling to that code, but never mind. Um, Rebar-based build, I mean, it's just so easy, you know, fighting for three or four days trying to use the, the, the RabbitMQ umbrella thing for, for working with plugins is just silly. I mean, essentially all Natalia had to do under SIGWIN was to type, like, those four commands to, to build RabbitHub on, on her laptop um, instead of having to do battle with uh, Ubuntu and all sorts of strange stuff that, that, that she didn't necessarily work with all that often. Um, I mean, as far as Rabbit Hub goes, the rebar config is pretty simple. The only dependency really is, is this thing that I've um, got here, Rabbit Common, which is uh, just the common stuff you need when you're building a plugin, um, HRL files, things like that. Um, and that's versioned. Um, so, you, you know, when you build Rabbit Hub for RabbitMQ 3.2.1, you're going to get the right, the right version of the Rabbit Common and so forth. So, the resulting solution. Um, uh, perfect, really, for, for what Lucid Logistics required. Uh, it's very simple for Natalia to fold this into the overall processing stream, um, as illustrated on the diagram. Um, I never noticed before how this is like a, like a rabbit, right? Um, excellent. So essentially, uh, most of the code on your side is in, in C Sharp, uh, and it's publishing, publishing messages via HTTP post into Rabbit Hub, and those messages are being pushed out to whoever's subscribed to them and so forth. Um, no polling overhead, all goodness there. Um, the messages happen to be formatted in JSON, but like I said, the solution really doesn't care what, what format they're in at all. Not a problem. Um, and also, like I said, you can do all sorts of good stuff with Rabbit and Erlang, and we can, do, we can cluster it and you know, have replicated queues and all sorts of fancy things like that. And from the customer's perspective, message latencies, they, well, they don't have to poll uh, or anything like that. And the latencies have gone down from minutes to, to milliseconds. So happy customer, in my experience, is a good customer. Um, just a, a simple illustration, really, before I hand back to Natalia about um, how you subscribe to Rabbit Hub. Um, so again, just using a really, really simple curl command. When, I, when I'm testing this thing, I tend to actually do it using uh, Ruby Sinatra, which is why port 567, 4567 is there. But that's beside the point. Um, the curl command here, uh, essentially what that's saying is that any, any messages that get published to the exchange amq.direct here uh, with a routing key of foo are going to be forwarded by Rabbit Hub to this URL, to the callback URL that we've nominated. Um, and this particular subscription, the lease is going to expire after 600 seconds, which is maybe not such a good idea. Um, you can specify essentially an infinite lease um, or you can put some time restriction on it. These subscriptions can be to a queue or an exchange. If you subscribe to an exchange, then Rabbit Hub creates an exclusive queue for you and binds it to that exchange uh, and things like that. And Rabbit Hub doesn't care how messages get into a queue. So, you know, Rabbit supports other protocols like Stomp and MQTT and obviously AMQP. It really doesn't matter how messages are published into Rabbit, how they arrive in the queue, as far as Rabbit Hub is concerned, is irrelevant. It's still going to push them out to the consumers. Okay. 
Uh, and from a, a management perspective, as far as Natalia is concerned, it's a very, very simple little script to provision a user, create whatever queues they might need, create their login details, and so forth. Done in a matter of minutes. And we'll hand back to you to sum up. <coughs> so the current status is that uh, this implementation has been on production for a few months now. We do have a couple of uh, beta customers that are pretty happy with it. And uh, whenever we have a sales call with some prospects, this question always comes up. So it's very important for customer to have access, uh, direct access to their data, not through some kind of reporting and UI. Um, uh, packages but like direct data feed and so whenever that question comes up we say yeah we can push the data no problem and that um, actually is a big point in our sales process um, potential future development so this says future but it's actually already been implemented so as soon as we got RabbitMQ installed we realized oh we can use it for some other things because um, obviously when we receive data from satellite provider from our region, uh we don't immediately put it in the database because we need to apply um, our algorithms for parsing it and so we used to have our own homegrown queues for that and then we're like oh <laughs> <laughs> that can go away, and so we replaced it with RabbitMQ, and uh, that was a very successful change, and we're very happy about it. Um, so I guess <coughs> that's uh, a summary. Um, so we got rid of polling. Our customers are happy. We're happy. Uh, we um, were extremely, I was extremely pleased with support from um, RabbitMQ community. Um, I did tr uh, test drive a couple of other, like uh, Brad mentioned, uh, there are a couple of other implementations on PubSub, Hubbub site. They're like Ra Ruby on Rails, PHP, um, can't remember something else. So I test drove those and, uh, and Google's own, and I did not get good response from even like Google groups forever, <laughs> trying to get through littlest problems. And so, but RabbitMQ was extremely helpful and we're very happy about uh, that side of things as developers. Um, so I guess that would finish our talk. I don't know yeah. <laughs> if you have any questions. Uh, no, I, I think that's about it. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. What are you doing about the security aspect? It's a HTTPS connection, so hopefully it's all encrypted. But are you, are you, I can't remember whether you're on a like a private network or is it a, it is going out over the internet, but it's encrypted. Are you into our customers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just goes over HTTPS. We don't provide VPN, I, I, and it's been sufficient. So uh, both sides, we give them. Um, uh, the hub link, the hub URL is HTTPS and their site. So obviously they have to run web server to be able to accept our post. So they're um, using HTTPS as well. So we think we're pretty good. And you issue the certificate for that? Um, no. <laughs> we tell them to get <laughs> a certificate from trusted authority. <laughs> No, so the, the way it's implemented at the moment, the, this, it's a fairly implicit assumption that the messages are getting in there, so there's no publisher confirms or anything like that at the moment. Um, and, and the way it's being used at the moment, that doesn't seem to be necessary. But uh, like I said, you know, as far as Rabbit's concerned, so at the moment Natalia is pushing, publishing the messages in there via HTTP through Rabbit Hub, but you could just as easily publish those messages in via AMQP and do the, the publisher confirms thing and, and so forth. Do you, do you sorry. You're publishing messages in via HTTP at the moment, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, note that you could actually publish messages in uh, via HTTP just using the management API as well, uh, or any, as I say, any other protocol that Rabbit supports. Or, or they say, well, we've changed our URL to 
this uh, other way the URL was invalid and that all the other URLs actually um, messages with your address and all the URLs. Yeah. I suppose that's more, well, the, the latter part of your question, I guess, is more a coordination thing with the customer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So far we had one case uh, of customer returning 500 to us, in which case we terminate the subscription. And the customer, of course, they don't always read the doc documentation, so they got kind of like, what's going on? Where's my messages? Like, read the doc. We just terminated. You have to return to 100. <laughs> And so they just resubs in which case they just uh, resubscribe and they get all the spooled messages. The messages are spooling in the queue, and as soon as they uh, subscribe back to us, we push it. All those messages. Do you have any kind of um, exponential backlog project for <coughs> delivering like the slow? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think y you could probably handle that reasonably well with Rabbit. Um, yeah, a little bit of work maybe, but you know I wouldn't be too worried about large numbers of messages queuing up. The, the biggest issue there is more likely to be the, the guy at the other end, you know, the URL that's copying all those messages just one after the other and whether they can absorb them. Um, I'm not sure what the best approach would be there. Possibly we could look at modifying Rabbit Hub to just put some kind of throttle on or something like that maybe. Um. Uh, does Rabbit Hub provide any, any algorithms for handling the messages? Yes, it does. So that, that's another option. For example, if if you can't um, uh, if you can't shift a message, or you could set messages up. For example, you can put an expiry time on messages. So maybe if a message hasn't been consumed within an hour, just to pick a number, uh, you can have Rabbit configured to shift that message into a dead letter queue. Yeah. But do you have a uh, send logic on that? Uh, you can do that as well. Yes. It's, uh, it's pretty flexible in that sort of regard. There's some fairly sophisticated functionality in there. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about how Rabbit IQ handles it, but uh, um, just thinking that Rabbit Hub, Hub actually provides some implementation. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, it's tightly integrated with Rabbit, so it's able to take pretty much full advantage of those things. Um, I mean, if you had messages going into a dead letter queue, you'd probably have to write some little bit of code to make sure they loop back around. But, you know, it's not going to be big. Any other questions? All done, lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.